Yesterday, Russia used its veto to block a U.N. Security Council resolution condemning last week's poison gas attack in Syria. Here's the Security Council's debate on the resolution. It's two hours. Good morning. The 7,921st meeting of the Security Council is called to order. The provisional agenda for this meeting is the situation in the Middle East. The agenda is adopted. In accordance with Rule 37 of the Council's provisional rules of procedure, I invite the representative of the Syrian Arab Republic to participate in this meeting. It is so decided. In accordance with Rule 39 of the Council's Provisional Rules of Procedure, I invite Mr. Stefan de Mistura, Special Envoy of the Secretary General for Syria, to participate in this meeting. It is so decided. Security Council will now begin its consideration of Item 2 on the agenda. Good morning, Mr. de Mistura. Welcome. We're glad to have you, and I now give you the floor. Thank you, thank you, Madam Ambassador, Madam Chair, thank you. Um, Madam President and dear colleagues, uh, the stakes in Syria today are very high. We all know why. In light of the recent developments, two paths lie before us. One is more outrages more destruction and death, stoked by regional and international divisions, or even escalation and deeper confrontation. That is what all Syrians fear, and uh, I share their fears. But there is another path, more serious discussion, a real de-escalation and ceasefire, and a rallying behind the only way out of the Syrian nightmare. We urgently need a consensus among major stakeholders to support concretely the UN-led negotiation process. And this is the occasion for doing it, with the goal of a package for an orderly, mapped out, credible, and irreversible agreed political transition as per 2254. Before the events of last week, we had made modest but incremental progress towards that goal. The fifth round of intra-Syrian talks in Geneva saw no breakthroughs, let's be frank, but no breakdowns either. The parties engaged, indeed engaged, on substance for nine full days, not a small feat. The discussions were mostly businesslike, correct, and uh, on the final day, they told me, all of them, they were ready to return to Geneva for a sixth round in May at our invitation. The government and the opposition discussed in parallel, in the format of proximity talks, all four baskets, governance issues, constitutional process issues, election issues, and counterterrorism, security governance, and confidence building measures. These discussions were framed by the goal of a political transition while preserving, obviously, we don't want mistake like we have done in the past, the sovereignty, unity, independence, and territorial integrity of Syria within the context of the Geneva Communique, Security Council Resolution 2118, 2254, 2268, 2336. You're all familiar with them. You made them and the statements of the International Syrian Support Group. Yes, the delegations prefer to focus on different issues, and yes, the gaps are still wide, but everyone in Geneva did engage on all baskets. They also discussed general principles regarding the character of a future post-transition Syrian state. These UN ideas remain living points, 
that can be further developed as the negotiation progress on the substance of each of the baskets. One day, soon we hope, all of this discussion must come together into a package for an overall negotiation, a real negotiation. While it was premature to secure common understanding at this stage, some points became quite clear or more clear than before, at least to me, and perhaps to the Syrians too. For example, I felt a growing appreciation that the basis of transition must be legally and constitutionally solid, and that the journey and destination well mapped out and agreed upon. I had hoped that we could have proceeded in more detail on the constitutional dimension, which has a potential, how to ensure the constitutional basis of the transition and how Syrians in transition mode might write and agree a new constitution. But nevertheless, there was a deepening of the process and this should not be underestimated. But now, let's be frank, this fragile progress is in, indeed in grave danger. Already in Geneva, the talks were overshadowed by an intensification of fighting on the ground and continued lack of safe, sustained, and impeded humanitarian access. I said formal written appeals to the Astana ceasefire guarantors, Russian Federation, Turkey, and Iran. I, all, I did urge all with influence and leverage to restore the credibility of the ceasefire and to do more to ensure that the UN can reach, and we are ready to do so, 4.7 million people in hard to reach and besieged areas. Displacement also has continued. Over the last months, more than 6,000 fighters and their own families were evacuated from Al Wahir to Idlib as part of local agreements. And we also learned of serious developments regarding the so-called four towns. Political statements issued after the Geneva talks also sent some worrying signals. The government stated its intention to reconquer the entire territory of Syria rather than emphasizing a ceasefire on and with real negotiations. Some opposition voices, on the other hand, also expressed support for military offensives, including battles led by internationally prohibited terrorist groups, or cast even doubts on the need to return to Geneva and give priority to military solutions. Then, as representatives from over 70 countries and international organizations gathered in Brussels in what was supposed to be and has been an important meeting regarding the future of Syria and address Syrian humanitarian needs and commit to a post-transition reconstruction, which is terribly needed, we witnessed the horrors, the horrors inflicted by chemical weapons on Syrian innocent victims, including children, women, and men in Khan Sheikhoun. This outrage shocked the conscience of the whole human family. People all over the world also realized anew, once again, that the Syrian calamity is not just an affront to our shared values. It can affect the lives of citizens of any land, particularly if chemical weapons are used, or war crimes, or terrorism, or mass displacement, an unending war is accepted as something that we have to live with. The Syrians cannot live with it, and neither can we, wherever we are. A few days later, the United States targeted Al Shairat Air Base with a strike by 59 Tomahawk missiles. Under Secretary General Feldman briefed you on this extremely serious development last Friday. And since then, we have seen more fighting and violence with new claims of the use of cluster ammunition in inhabited areas, barrel bombs, incendiary weapons, including in close proximity to Khan Sheikhoun itself. Secretary General has made clear his own position. He is abhorred by the chemical weapons attack in Khan Sheikhoun and calls for accountability for such crimes. In the aftermath of the US strike, he is mindful of the risk of escalation and appeals for restraint. He calls for reinstating a national-wide ceasefire. 
And he called for a, a refocus on the need for a political solution, which is also essential in the fight against terrorism. This is a time for clear thinking, strategy, imagination, cooperation. On the ground, those who do not want a negotiated political settlement, we call them the spoilers, as you know, are stopping at nothing to undermine the political process. They want us to fall in their own trap. We must not allow that to happen. We must all resolve that the time has come where the intra-Syrian talks move beyond preparatory discussions and into a real heart of the matter across all four baskets to secure a meaningful negotiated transition package. The United Nations is ready to its part, Madam President. I have consulted the Secretary General, and I personally remain at my post and will continue to serve, especially in view of what is the current emergency. And I'm ready to reconvene talks in May. And the UN is ready to offer a real substantive starting point for discussion and negotiations among the Syrians. But let's see a few things sorted out first, if we can. U.S. Secretary of State Tillerson is, while we are talking in Moscow for meeting with the Russian government, we welcome this direct high-level diplomatic engagement at this crucial moment between the United States and Russia. I was in Moscow myself just before the last run, and in Washington yesterday, actually. And I did participate for the UN in a trilateral encounter with the US and Russia during the Geneva talks. These two countries, the co-chairs of the ISSG, have serious differences, we know it, but also common interests and, indeed, responsibilities. They must find a way to work together to stabilize the situation in a deliberate, realistic, and concerted way in support of the political process. And indeed, the council, our council, the region, and the ISSG members need to unite behind one process of mediation in Geneva. We also need the ceasefire guarantors to step up and deliver now. Important countries have assumed the responsibilities of guarantors. Those guarantees are being put to a severe test. Next week, the guarantors will meet in Tehran at a working level before a higher level meeting in Astana planned for early May. We urge them to work to renew the ceasefire and on confidence building measures linked to the ceasefire, along with a continued effort to fight terrorism. Astana must reinforce Geneva and vice versa. That is why the UN will be in Tehran and Astana and provide whatever technical support we can to what we consider a very important step. Madam President, you have heard it so many times. We have said it so many times all together. But I will say it again. There can only be a political solution to this bloody conflict. There is no military solution, regardless of what some try or believe. That what I hear from the Syrians from all walks of life. This is what we have been told from those who participated in the UN Civil Society Support Room and by the Women's Advisory Board. That is the voice of the Syrians. This is what you in the Council have long agreed upon. So let us view this moment of crisis, and it is a moment of crisis, as a watershed and an opportunity, perhaps, for a new level of seriousness in the search for a political solution. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Mr. De Mastora, and we very much thank you for your commitment and your leadership on this issue. Thank you. <clears throat> I now give the floor to council members to make their statements, and we will start by giving the floor to the United Kingdom. Thank you, Madam President, and I would also like to thank you, Stefan, for your briefing and for your unrelenting efforts to secure a political solution to the conflict in Syria. You have our continued full support. Despite your efforts and those of this council and the international community, the people of Syria have been denied a political solution for more than six years. They have suffered over six years of ever-increasing ever-escalating barbarity. Over six years of failed ceasefires 
and false dawns. For over six years, this council has been held to ransom by Russia's shameless support for the Assad regime, support which the regime is flaunting. Throughout that time, we have met in this chamber to discuss atrocity after atrocity, hoping that Assad had finally reached the depth of his cruelty and would finally see the need for dialogue. And yet every time, without fail, he has plunged to new lows. Chemical weapons scientists at Porton Down in the United Kingdom have analyzed samples obtained from Khan Shekun, and these have tested positive for the nerve agent sarin or a sarin-like substance. The United Kingdom therefore shares the US assessment that it is highly likely that the regime was responsible for a sarin attack on Khan Shekun on the 4th of April. This sickening use of chemical weapons, weapons that Assad agreed in 2013 to destroy, is just the latest in a long list of abhorrent attacks. With that attack, he has made clear that he is not committed to a ceasefire or to the Astana process, ruining Russia's credibility. And as we mourn the victims of the chemical attack on Khan Shekun, we must not forget the 13 and a half million people who, thanks to Assad, are in urgent need of humanitarian assistance, who are in urgent need of a long overdue peace. It is clear today, as it has been for some time, that there can be no place for Assad in Syria's future. But Madam President, there is a way to end this nightmare that the Syrian people continue to suffer. The Geneva Communique of 2012 and our unanimous resolution 2254 chart the way to peace in Syria. We have a special representative in you, Stefan, who is rightly determined to keep the political process alive and pursue a renewed UN-facilitated effort. We have an opposition prepared to take a pragmatic approach to discussions. And we have millions upon millions of Syrians inside and outside the country crying out for long overdue peace. And yet, we are still here in this chamber with the regime showing no interest in peace, encouraged by Russia's support in this council to keep dropping bombs, to keep using chemical weapons. Time and time again, Russia has abused its veto to protect the regime and to defend its use of chemical weapons. And what has Russia got in return for its seven vetoes in six years? Let me tell you. Russia's initiative in 2013 to dismantle Syria's chemical weapons has been exposed as a shambles. Russian pride in the Astana process has been turned to humiliation. And Russia's credibility and reputation across the world have been poisoned by its toxic association with Assad. They have chosen to side with a murderous, barbaric criminal rather than with their international peers. They have chosen the wrong side of history. However, it is not too late for Russia to change course. It is not too late for Russia to fulfill its responsibilities as a permanent member of this Security Council. It is not too late for Russia to use, finally, its influence over the regime to bring this conflict to an end. Those efforts must begin meaningfully with attempts to end the use of chemical weapons and barrel bombs, real efforts to bring about a ceasefire and real efforts to ensure proper humanitarian access. In doing so, Russia can create the space needed for a renewed push on the political process, one that leads to that political transition to a government that represents all Syrians. Should they do so, should they choose that path, we stand ready to work with Russia to preserve Syrian institutions through the political transition. We stand ready to find ways of cooperating with Russia to counter Daesh and other international terrorist threats. We stand ready to engage with Russia as a constructive partner on this council. While Assad offers Russia only shame and humiliation, we offer Russia something else, the chance once again to work with the international community 
as a credible member. Finally, Madam President, the Syrian people have waited for over six years. Hundreds of thousands have died. Countless hospitals, schools, and homes have been destroyed. Now, more than ever, the international community must come together to end this senseless conflict. And that's why we stand shoulder to shoulder with the United States and their decision to take military action against the Shirat airfield from where last week's attacks were launched. We stand shoulder to shoulder with our G7 allies and all those who are committed to deter the future use of chemical weapons and finally to bring peace to Syria. Thank you. Thank you to the representative of the United Kingdom. And now we will give the floor to the representative of Egypt. Madam President, we are meeting once again to discuss a crisis that has caused hundreds of thousands of innocent victims, that has displaced millions of families, that has contributed to creating a safe heaven for tens of thousands of mercenaries and terrorists whose presence is a threat to the region and to the world. However, and in spite of this humanitarian and security disaster that has struck Syria, in spite of the fact that the Syrian conflict is at the top of the list of priorities of the media and of uh, politicians, at the head of the priorities of the agenda of this Security Council and that for many years. And while we continue to, to rehash ad nauseum the same uh, condemnations and expressions of com compassion, this disaster rolls on unabated. Y years go by and the crisis only deepens and becomes more complex to such an extent that a political situation, which should have been a definitive uh, solution, is now only a first step to try to contain the disastrous repercussions that the Syrians uh, suffer and will continue to suffer, as well as the countries of the region, and for many years afterwards. I deplore, Madam President, that for throughout all these years, each time we thought that a political solution was uh, near, that the outline of a settlement was clear in our minds and in international documents, documents on which there was a consensus. Well, now we're once again in, uh, faced with a, another conundrum, another disjunction, another polar, international polarization and a regional one as well. The international community, instead of uh, managing to uh, uh, bring together the various uh, views within the uh, among the various Syrian parties are pushing them to hunker down and dig in their heels behind false hopes, the hopes of uh, achieving a hollow, illusory victory that they can't manage to achieve. A victory. Uh, the, 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 the march to that victory, uh, to this illusory victory, will only increase the suffering of the Syrian people. We have many times warned about the seriousness of accepting this polarization within this Security Council and outside the Security Council. And I've said more than once the uh, uh, the regional and international uh, race uh, that we're seeing, so to speak, or competition will only lead to more deaths. Not to interfere, not to support one of the parties in the Syrian conflict does not mean to abdicate one's responsibilities. Quite the contrary. It simply means that this crisis will have no uh, victor, that continuing this crisis will only mean the continuing uh, suffering among our Syrian brothers and sisters. We have sought to uh, reach an agreement within the council and outside the council to put an end to this war which is uh, uh, which is uh, waged by proxy and which threatens the uh, future of everyone once again i would like to call on the various international actors particularly the joint uh, chairmanship of the international series support group russia and the united states to work as quickly as possible to reach an agreement on the political area and and uh, uh, and I would like to underscore that uh, cooperation should be the main instrument to uh, 
كذلك دعوني أن أذكر السياسات السورية بجميع توجهاتها against those who tried to undermine uh, the uh, political horizon of, the, of a settlement. Those who uh, tried to use the vacuum uh, that uh, is created by this polarization, uh, uh, they're trying to undermine any attempt to put an end to this uh, crisis, they, they should, we should, which is why I would like to call on all the uh, Syrian parties, no matter what their orientation, to act responsibly and to engage in serious and objective negotiations based on good faith and without any preconditions. Uh, for the future of the country under the auspices of uh, the Special Envoy of the Secretary General, Mr. Demistour, I call on them to set aside their narrow interests and to understand that the loser, the losers are, the, are them and the Syrian people. Once again, I just want to recall that the interests of the Syrian people and the interests of these various parties will not be achieved by through support of uh, what, whoever their sponsors are from, from, from abroad and will only lead to more destruction and uh, further deep when the disaster in this country, a country that has made significant contributions to uh, Muslim, uh, Arab, and international culture. I do not exaggerate when I say that achieving uh, an agreement on the basis of the interest of the Syrian people will force everyone to accept the, the will of the Syrian people. Madam President, due to the seriousness of what Syria has experienced and the incapacity of this council to agree on to start uh, an, ins an investigation into Han Sheikhoun uh, events, I would like to call, uh, repeat our call to go, f to move forward and to investigate in a clear fashion and neutral fashion an independent one. In conclusion, I'd like to thank the uh, Special Envoy, uh, the Secretary General and the Special Envoy, Mr. Demistur, for their efforts. And I would like to repeat that Egypt will spare no efforts in supporting uh, their work uh, based on Resolution 2254 and the roadmap adopted. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you to the representative of Egypt. And now I'll give the floor to the representative of France. Madame la Présidente, Madam President, it is now a week since the regime attacked once again using chemical weapons. 86 people at least died from suffocation in Adlib and hundreds were injured. The symptoms observed as well as the tragic number of deaths are pointing to the use of a nerve agent, which is probably a sarin-based mix. The United States decision to strike the al Shaida air base is testimony to the gravity of the threat. It sent to the Syrian regime the message that it should have heard many years ago already. Uh, the time of its impunity is over. France proposed jointly with the United States and the United Kingdom a draft resolution which it is expected will be put to a vote soon in the Security Council. It is a simple and balanced text which condemns the 4th of April attack and reaffirms the United Nations' support for a verification, fact-finding mission of the act and the nature of the substances used. What is at stake is to bring the Council together around a key objective, which is to protect the international non-proliferation regime, which has been flouted by Syria, and to tackle the impunity of those who wage chemical attacks. Beyond the Khan Sheikhoun tragedy, all of Syria is is now a landscape of desolation and devastation and the cessation of hostilities as it should have been agreed upon by the 30th of December and a standard process agreement no longer exists. Support for the regime, uh, it has never really respected this ceasefire and the situation is deteriorating each day and everywhere the regime is tightening the vice on the civilian population by refusing to grant the necessary authorizations for the humanitarian convoys. Let us be clear, this is a deliberate uh, uh, policy of prevarication by 
and this is causing people to flee, and this is in contravention of Security Council resolutions and the fundamental principles of humanitarian law. Madam President, the allies of this Syrian regime are responsible through by making all bringing all pressure to bear on Syria to respect its obligations. First of all, Russia as a guarantor of the regime and based on the ceasefire agreement of 30 December must now walk its talk. In, in the near term, the urgency should be to enjoin the Syrian regime to respect the ceasefire and to allow for humanitarian assistance to everyone in need. The cessation of hostilities regime should also be completely overhauled. We must avoid the gaps of the previous one and come up with a more inclusive, coherent, and robust observation mechanism. Since September last year, France has called for a setting up an observation mechanism for the cessation of hostilities. Madam President, some deny the evidence, but come what may, we can no longer continue as if the 4th of April attack did not take place. We can no longer act as if this toll of chaos and desolation is not the result of the Assad regime. The Khan Sheikhoum attack is only a reminder of the sinister reality which France since August 2013 has been warning the Security Council about. We must come to an understanding today about the facts. A political solution leading to a genuine transition is more urgent and necessary than ever. As long as this regime is still in power because of its, po uh, its terror and destruction, with the complicity of those propping it up, there will never be peace or reconstruction in Syria. The millions of uh, refugees now on the road to exile have no hope of returning home, and we will never be able to tackle once and for all the terrorist threat, which continues to be stoked by the violence and desolation, which is a breeding ground for them. Madam President, the absolute urgency and the top most priority is the resumption of negotiations to seek to hammer out together a political solution. It therefore is incumbent on each and every one of us to make sure that we bring the pressure necessary to bear on the leading stakeholders so that once and for all they can engage in good faith in these negotiations. And in this connection, France renews its fullest support and its confidence in the special envoy to Syria, Mr. Stéphane de Mistura, whose commitment is exemplary. We commend his announcement of the resumption of uh, negotiations on the UN auspices in mid-May and to start the next cycle of negotiations on an accelerated timeline with a view to arriving as soon as possible to a transition, a political transition agreement based on the general communique and the relevant, relevant resolutions. And we must all now shoulder our responsibilities, each and every one of us, and to support this solution beyond our political choices, beyond our national interests, and even beyond our moral considerations. This is an imperative that bears on our collective security, and it is at the heart of our mandate and the shared responsibility of all members of this Security Council. Madam President, in conclusion, the recent developments have moved the lines and shown, if ever there was a need to show, the urgency of the need for a political transition in Syria. And it has created, we hope, the conditions for re-engagement of all the leading players who must find a political solution. And given this tra tragedy in Syria, which continues to spiral downwards to the deepest abysses, we are more duty-bound than ever, but we also are faced with the opportunity of breathing new decisive life into this political solution. So let us make sure we seize this opportunity. This is a time of truth. 
Let us make sure that we seize this opportunity and together we shoulder our responsibilities at this historic moment. Thank you. I thank the representative of France and now give the floor to the representative of Uruguay. <coughs> Thank you very much, Madam President. We would once again like to thank Special Envoy of the Secretary General, Mr. de Mistura, and his whole team for his tireless uh, work uh, and determination to move forward in spite of all the difficulties. We are also very happy to hear that he will continue uh, uh, moving forward in the face of all these difficulties. Madam President, we have full trust in Mr. de Mistura and full trust in the efforts of our Secretary General, uh, Mr. Antonio Guterres, to continue uh, in uh, search for a political solution to the crisis in Syria. Now, neither Stefan de Mistura nor Antonio de Guterres are the main actors of this tragedy. And the um, primary responsibility in this situation falls on the Syrians, on the government, the opposition, civil society, and the religious leaders. It is up to them to, uh, to uh, assume the responsibility for uh, uh, determining their future. And to do that, there is only one way to do it, to sit around a table and, and engage in discussions. Stefan has been working specifically on that, but Stefan is not the person who can who can take decisions uh, for the Syrians that they themselves have to take. Another subsidiary responsibility, Madam President, falls on uh, third states, those who should uh, stop interfering in the Syrian conflict uh, for to advance their uh, own interests. Another responsibility that is no, uh, no less important is uh, falls on this Security Council, Madam President, that must exert pressure and, and uh, must seek to persuade to continue to, to have the parties negotiating. And we should take advantage of the, the, the momentum that was launched in December with the most recent uh, cessation of hostilities and then continued with the Astana process and then the, me the monitoring mechanism on the ceasefire. The, uh, the events of last week only strengthen our conviction that there is no possibility of a military solution to this conflict and only through a political process agreed uh, by the Syrians and uh, the mediation of the United Nations can we find a solution. We'd like to reiterate our strongest condemnation uh, uh, for, uh, of the continued use of chemical weapons in Syria and we insist that regarding all, all confirmed uses of chemical weapons, uh, and this applies to last week's and all, every other's. What is required is an impartial, independent uh, investigation to identify the who's responsible for this crime and to uh, hold them to account. Uh, we would like to reiterate our appeal to, to calm and uh, to refrain from any unilateral action that leads to an escalation of tensions. The Syrian conflict should uh, be dealt with in a multilateral framework. Madam President, uh, we are aware that the, the absence of a negotiated uh, uh, settlement has only one victim, that is the, the Syrian people, the, uh, the people on the street, the men, women, children, uh, old, older people. Our collective responsibility is to think uh, of them. Thank you very much, Madam President. I thank the representative of Uruguay and now give the floor to the representative of Senegal. Madam President, thank you for convening this briefing on Syria. I'd like to thank the Special Representative of the Secretary General on Syria, Mr. Stefan de Mistura, for his tireless efforts in the service of peace, which we are now pursuing in Syria. Also, I would like to commend the spirit of responsibility demonstrated by actors during the fifth round of discussions between Syrian parties held in Geneva from the 23rd to the 30th, 31st of March this year. 
The fact that these discussions were held as planned without interruption or anyone walking away is testimony to the commitment and the determination of those parties to the talks. Bearing in mind the complexity of the substantive uh, items on the agenda, such as the political transition, national integrity, counterterrorism, and uh, confidence building measures without forgetting governance, security, and constitutional reform. My delegation wishes to see this spirit of sacrifice and selflessness, which must drive all parties, continue to be the main motive of the parties and that it will continue to prevail so that we can, as soon as possible, come to a lasting solution to this crisis, which has l lasted for too long. Madam President, we reiterate our hope to see a cessation of hostilities across all of Syria's territory and to see it hold and strengthen, especially within the framework of the trilateral mechanism, monitoring mechanism agreed upon in Astana. And we welcome the efforts of the main players here, I cite Russia, Turkey, and Iran. It's important that this uh, ceasefire be uh, translate into an ongoing, onto, into ongoing uh, in improvement of humanitarian supplies. And here, my delegation welcomes the conference on Syria, and we believe that this should. Be complimentary. My delegation welcomes the holding of the conference on Syria on the 4th and 5th of April in Brussels at the initiative of the European Union in collaboration with the UN. This conference uh, saw major pledges made, totaling 6 billion US dollars for 2017 in a bid to provide assistance and to tackle the major challenges faced by Syria, which over six years of conflict has seen its level of development regress four years. Madam President, Syria is facing a multidimensional crisis, we have said it on many occasions, political, humanitarian, security, and non-proliferation challenges. I wanted to touch on the security aspect of things, the fight against terrorism, especially against ISIL and ex-Al-Nusra Front, is an absolute priority for us. And it's for this reason that we reiterate the need to implement a comprehensive strategy which respects international humanitarian law and the relevant resolutions of the Security Council. With respect to non-proliferation, I unreservedly condemn, as I did last week, the recent use of chemicals as weapons in Syria. And in the same vein, Senegal once again encourages the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons through its fact-finding mission, mission to gather and study with all the required professionalism data on, from all available sources so as to attribute responsibility for the chemical weapons attack that we saw in Khan Sheikhoun. It is our hope to see our council agree on this essential issue of accountability following this dastardly act, which affected many Syrians, including children. As we had to do five days ago, my delegation continues to insist on the absolute need for a peaceful settlement of this crisis so as to deal with 
the challenges, namely the repeated use of chemical weapons, proliferation of, proliferation of terrorist groups, and even more serious, uh, unprecedented humanitarian crisis. Therefore, I'd like to reaffirm our conviction that only a negotiated political solution based on the Geneva Communique and Resolution 2254 of 2015 will enable us to come to a lasting solution to this conflict. It is therefore our hope that the meeting between the Secretary of State and Russian Foreign Minister will be successful. And we hope also that the international Syria support group and its co-presidents, which are the US and Russia, will continue to give the necessary support to the efforts of our special envoy, Mr. de Mistura. And here, in conclusion, I'd like to reiterate Senegal's fullest support for the tireless efforts being made, especially since you just confirmed that you intend to convene the next round next month. Thank you. I thank the representative of Senegal, and I'll now give the floor to the representative of Japan. Madam President, I thank Special Envoy Stefan de Mistura for his extensive briefing and commend his efforts and his commitment to keep the political process moving forward. The first round of intra-Syrian talks in Geneva demonstrated the willingness of all sides to talk seriously with both the government and opposition groups undertaking discussions without a major pause or suspension. Mr. de Mistura described for us today that there have been discussions on main substantive issues while pointing out the need to move beyond the preparatory stages. Madam President, <clears throat> regrettably, the relatively positive news from Geneva is outweighed by grim news on the ground. The alleged use of chemical weapons last week is an affront to humanity and blatant violation of Security Council resolutions. The Council must reaffirm its determination to urgently address this alleged use of chemical weapons. At the same time, we must not lose sight of the humanitarian situation as a whole. Even with a monthly meeting on the humanitarian situation, it is important that we emphasize it here in the context of political process as well. We were shocked by the use of chemical weapons, but we have also been shocked by many months, for many months, by the enormous number of besieged people, now at 644,000, according to OCHA. Madam President, Japan's position is clear. We will continue our assistance to all Syrian people in need. This means not simply contributing funds, but taking the responsibility to ensure that aid reaches the people who need it. For this reason, our attention turns again to the United Nations' repeated warnings that bureaucratic impediments are the main obstacles to humanitarian access. We have repeatedly urged the Syrian government, which bears primary responsibility for this obstructed uh, access, to simplify procedures. Japan is deeply disappointed that even on occasions when the Syrian government has responded, we have not seen any significant change. We will continue to engage closely with other relevant parties to improve access, but we cannot fully succeed without the Syrian government's cooperation. Madam President, last year, Mr. de Mistura often used the metaphor of a three-legged stool for Syria. The first leg, the political process, seems more steady after the recent Geneva talks and we strongly support UN efforts there. The second leg, the ceasefire, is starting to wobble with news about fighting. Japan supports efforts by the three guarantors of the Astana process, 
the only functioning ceasefire mechanism at the present time. We are also encouraged that Mr. De Mistura is extending support to Astana. The third leg, the humanitarian axis, is very unstable. We need to see major improvements to send a clear message to the Syrian people that they have not been abandoned. Madam President, the facts are clear. <clears throat> the ISSG continues to work despite some confrontations. UN mediation is making some progress. Humanitarian bodies are making their utmost effort under difficult circumstances. The OPCW and Jim are ready to implement their mandates. But what about the Security Council? We must prove that this institution is also serious about finding a solution to this crisis. Proof is long overdue. I thank you, Madam President. I thank the representative of Japan, and now I will give the floor to the representative of China. Thank you, Madam President. China welcomes the convening of today's open meeting and thanks Special Envoy de Mistura for his briefing. The Syrian conflict has been going on for six years now, resulting in large civilian casualties and state destruction. China is deeply sympathetic to the suffering endured by the Syrian people and strongly appeal to all Syrian parties to proceed from the future of the country and the welfare of its people to find an appropriate solution to the conflict sooner through dialogue and consultation. Recently, the relevant parties made joint diplomatic efforts and launched the Astana talks on Syria, maintained the overall momentum of Syrian ceasefire and created conditions to resume the Geneva talks. China hopes that the Astana talks continue to play its important role in maintaining ceasefire and advancing Geneva talks for progress. Political solution is the only way out for the Syrian issue. Military means will not solve the problem. In the last round of Geneva talks, all Syrian parties negotiated on the four baskets of issues on political governance, constitutional issues, election and counterterrorism, security and confidence building measures. This gave expression to their attitude of earnest participation and enabled positive progress in the political process of Syria. Under the current situation, all relevant parties should uh, stick to and not waver on diplomatic efforts, prevent the deterioration of the Syrian situ uh, situation, continue to support the UN as the main channel for good offices and support the work of Special Envoy de Mistura. Uh, the Security Council should prioritize the interest of Syria and its people and play its constructive role in advancing the Syrian political process. China. Uh, appeals to all Syrian parties to continue to maintain ceasefire, follow the Syrian-owned and Syrian-led principle to gradually come up with a comprehensive and durable solution acceptable to all through dialogue and negotiation. The fight against terrorism is an important and pressing issue in the solution of the Syrian issue. Counterterrorism situation in some parts of Syria has taken on new complexities recently. The international community should be highly vigilant on related development, strengthen coordination and cooperation, unify standards, and fight against all terrorist organizations listed by the Security Council. China welcomes the Brussels International Conference on Syria convened recently. China would like to work with the international, international community and continue to play our positive and constructive role in advancing the political solution of the Syrian issue and easing the humanitarian situ situation of Syria so as to advance a comprehensive, just and appropriate solution to the Syrian issue at an early date. Thank you, Madam President. I thank the representative of China and now give the floor to the representative of Sweden. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, and also a great uh, 
thank you to Stefan de Mistura for his efforts. We stand fully behind you and the Secretary General and the political solution that you tirelessly strive for and which can be the only way forward. Madam President, when we spoke in this chamber last week at several occasions, we expressed our outrage over the atrocity in Kain Sheikhoun, Idlib. But let's not forget that every day the Syrian people continue to suffer the brutality of war in all its forms. Despite the horrifying images and the gruesome description in the world media, an heroic effort by humanitarian workers and endless discussions in this council over the years, this now routine brutality has continued unabated. It is high time to end the war. Madam President, I believe we have reached a critical moment. In order to move forward, Sweden calls upon this council and the wider membership present in this room to redouble efforts on three or four fronts. First, reinvigorate the political process. Two, revitalize the ceasefire. And three, grant full humanitarian access. And I'd like to add a fourth point, and that is for this council to fully shoulder its responsibilities. First, we all know that a political solution is the only way to end the Sy Syrian tragedy that has now lasted over six years. The shared objective remains a negotiated transitional political process in line with Resolution 2254. We therefore welcome the conclusion of the fifth round of intra-Syrian talks in Geneva. The next round of talks should resume as soon as circumstances allow in mid-May. Mid we offer our wholehearted support to the Secretary General's Special Envoy and his leadership, including his efforts to ensure the full and effective participation of women and civil society in the political process. While we welcome the progress from the talks and that both parties have engaged on the, all the 3.1 plus one baskets, we still feel that they need to do more. In the next round, the Syrian government's delegations, delegation needs to seriously, meaningfully, and concretely engage on all baskets. The opposition delegation has engaged constrict constructively and maturely, but needs to continue efforts to maintain unity. Second, over the last couple of weeks, we've witnessed an intensifica intensification of fighting. The ceasefire developed through the Astana process is increasingly threatened. The UN-led political process will not seriously, uh, is be, be, will be put seriously at risk without an effective nationwide ceasefire. And we therefore urge the grantors of the ceasefire agreement to live up to their commitment from Astana and to stop, step up their efforts, including towards a more effective monitoring mechanism. We call upon all actors present here today with influence over the parties to help put an end to violations and to reduce violence. Third, we all urgently need to do more to increase humanitarian access. Convoy deliveries during the last week of March shows that access to besieged and hard to reach areas is possible when there is a will. We call on the Syrian authorities here today to simplify the approval process as requested by the United Nations. We urgently need a systematic shift to sustain an unhindered humanitarian access. UN aid convoys are ready to assist 300,000 people every week who are now suffering in horrendous conditions in hard to reach and besieged areas. They must be given the administrative appro approvals to do so. Madam President, with regard to the repugnant attack in Khan Sheikhoun on 4th of April, we regret that the Council has so far not been able to agree on a strong resolution. There must be a rapid, full and impartial investigation to confirm the use of chemical weapons and those responsible for this horrendous attack must be held to account. And we will continue to pursue efforts to this end. Madam President, unspeakable atrocities and crimes against humanity have been committed during this conflict. While long overdue, we must now do our utmost to end the war in Syria. We all agree on the need for a sustainable political solution Let's therefore engage seriously to make it happen. This is a shared responsibility, particularly and not least for this Security Council. I thank you very much.
I thank the representative of Sweden and now give the floor to the representative of Kazakhstan. Thank you, Madam President. My delegation expresses appreciation to Special Envoy Stefan de Mistura for his update and uh, commend him for his determined spirit, commitment, and leadership. <laughs> we also welcome our colleague, Ambassador of the Syrian Arab Republic, Bashar al Jafari. My delegation would like to make the following observations and recommendations. The developments of the last week around the chemical weapons situation have a direct bearing on the political work track. We therefore call on all sides to work towards elaboration, a compromise, so that the political process can move forward. We welcome and support the multifaceted diplomacy you are conducting, Mr. Demistura. We know the efforts made by the UN and yourself for the settlement of the Syrian conflict, and especially to encourage the participation of almost all major groups of the Syrian opposition in the fifth round of the Geneva talks. <clears throat> it is only such a direction that can lead to a peaceful solution and ending the conflict in Syria. It gives us optimism that at Geneva 5, held from 23rd to 31st of <laughs> March, the negotiators were able this time to move from discussing formal and procedural <coughs> issues to the substantive and political aspects of future peace talks. We believe that relieving the political situation will enhance our political objectives. The crisis in Syria is still unfolding and has its impact on the entire region. Kazakhstan, therefore, believes that the regional approach involving neighboring countries should be considered in preventing further deterioration. In this regard, my country calls on all countries of the Middle East and the Gulf region to join the guarantor countries to do everything possible to ensure that the ceasefire regime is respected and observed by all parties and support the guarantors. Asana process is important to reach CBMs, and we call on all parties to work together to achieve a political settlement. <coughs> Kazakhstan is deeply concerned with the situation surrounding the use of chemical weapons in Syria. For the sake of the future of the Syrian people, Asana calls on all members of the Security Council to remain as united as when uh, they adopted Resolution 2336 last December and demonstrate the same solidarity in moving towards a political settlement as in Resolution 2254 adopted in November 2015. <coughs> Kazakhstan welcomes the declaration of the 28th summit of the League of Arab States aimed at peaceful resolution of the Syrian crisis and acknowledges enormous efforts of the members of that organization. We recognize with gratitude a special role of the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, in particular His Majesty King Abdullah II himself, to receive 1.3 million Syrian refugees and therefore call upon the international community to support Jordan and other countries that have accepted Syrian refugees. Kazakhstan uh, urges all sides to make possible, urgent, unrestricted access to besieged areas without preconditions to the United Nations and its implementing partners. It is essential that humanitarian assistance reaches people promptly for their survival needs and medical care. I thank you, Madam President. I thank the representative of Kazakhstan, and now I will turn it over to the representative of Ethiopia. Thank you, Madam President. I, I wish to start by thanking Special Envoy Stefan de Mistura uh, for his briefing on the outcome of the latest round of talks in Geneva. Let me take this opportunity to once again express our full support for his tireless and dedicated diplomatic efforts to help bring an end to the Syrian crisis. We appreciate his wisdom and leadership in facilitating the intra-Syrian talks, and we take note of the limited but incremental progress that has been made with the latest rounds which have allowed the parties to once again sit in the same room and start engaging substantively 
on the four basket issues towards resolving the Syrian crisis. Madam President, it's very clear that we are meeting today against the backdrop of the reports of the use of chemical weapons on April 4, which has shocked and appalled all of us here and indeed the whole world. We hope that this reported incident will not have serious impact on the political track. The issue now is how, while doing what we must to ensure accountability, we can return to an honest pursuit of the noble goal of making progress toward peaceful settlement and thus end the suffering of the Syrian people who have endured so much over the past seven years. We believe the G7 has struck the right note in their joint communique in Luca, Italy of April 11, when they said, and I quote, believe, they believe that there is an opportunity to bring this tragic crisis to an end and that all major partners will live up to their international responsibilities and seize this opportunity, end of quotation. Even, it is even more encouraging to hear them state that if the situation is conducive and others also meet their obligations, they will be prepared to, to do their part by, I quote, pursuing a political settlement and ultimately contributing to the costs of stabilization and reconstruction, end of quotation. As we said time and again, it's only through a comprehensive political solution that this objective can be realized. That's why we need to fully support the intra-Syrian talks and the efforts of the Special Envoy de Mistura. Again, in this connection, the message of solidarity that came out of the Brussels high-level conference on supporting the future of Syria and the region was indeed timely and important in creating a supporting environment for the Geneva talks under the auspices of the United Nations. Now is the time for this council to do everything possible to make sure that there is tangible progress in the peace talks. In this regard, it is absolutely necessary that those who have influence over the parties exercise the necessary leverage on them to seriously and constructively engage in the talks with a clear commitment to end the conflict. It has become very clear that without the involvement and cooperation of major powers and indeed countries of the region, nothing will move. It is with this in mind that we, like the Special Envoy, de Mistura, look forward to the outcome of the meeting between the foreign ministers of the United States and Russia in Moscow today. Madam President, of course, we have been following the developments on the ground and we are deeply disturbed by the continued fighting across uh, many parts of Syria. The military approach should not be allowed to have the upper hand. We believe the role of the guarantors is critical in ending the violations of the ceasefire and consolidating the Astana process. We very much hope that the next Astana talks, which is expected to take place next month, will be instrumental in this regard. Without the full implementation of the ceasefire, the prospect for any progress in the intra-Syrian talks would, would be dim. Finally, what we have understood in the course of the past three months or so in this council is that there is indeed convergence of views on a number of important issues con concerning the crisis in Syria. Everybody agrees that there is no alternative to a political solution. Everybody also agrees on the need to fight terrorism and violent extremism in Syria. 
we all agree on the need to ensure safe and unhindered humanitarian access. Furthermore, everybody agrees the use of chemical weapons is totally unacceptable. And any party, state or non-state, which is found guilty of such crime must be held accountable. Therefore, we should really capitalize on what unites us to ensure progress on finding a lasting political settlement to the Syrian crisis and the realization of the hope expressed in Luka by the G7 foreign ministers. We know this is easier said than done, but if there is a necessary political will, we don't believe it is too difficult to overcome the current paralysis and achieve a breakthrough. Thank you, Madam President. I thank the representative of Ethiopia, and now I give the floor to the representative of the Russian Federation. Спасибо, госпожа председатель. President. We're grateful to Mr. Demisturi for his briefing. Russia, Russia was closely involved in the March round of inter-Syrian negotiations in Geneva, and we uh, have urged all its participants to constructive uh, search for mutually acceptable uh, solutions and compromises on the political track. We have been actively uh, in touch with the uh, Syrian authorities in this context and also with a broad range of opposition movements. We support uh, you, Mr. Demistura, in your efforts, and we we hope that you will uh, uh, further step up these efforts. The fact that the Geneva process has been uh, developing and that the parties have uh, been discussing in parallel all the four agreed baskets of the agenda is very important. And the fact that they uh, agreed to the, some of the conceptual proposals made by you, by, by your mediation, Mr. Demistura, can all this can be considered as significant achievements. We expect uh, uh, the Geneva process to continue in a sustainable way. There should be no lengthy pauses in it. We had this negative experience in 2016. Uh, Mr. de Mistura, you cannot flag in your efforts. You must continue uh, in your work with the Syrian delegations, uh, actively urging them to dialogue and to finding common denominators. But the statement of the representative of uh, Great Britain, Mr. Reichardt, uh, showed that the only thing he's thinking of is uh, to complicate your efforts, Mr. de Mistura, to uh, prevent the political process from unfolding, uh, to bring into the Security Council a confrontational uh, uh, attitude. Uh, uh, and uh, the sub the essence is, and everyone in the UN knows this very well, that you are afraid. You have been losing sleep uh, over the fact that we might be working together with the United States, cooperating with the United States. That is what you fear. You're doing everything to make sure that this kind of cooperation be undermined. This is precisely why you look at me when I'm speaking? Don't don't look away. Why are you why are you looking away? This is precisely why you today didn't say anything about the political process. You didn't even listen to Mr. De Mistura's briefing on purpose. You make uh, you make insulting demands. Uh, the guarantor of the Astana process. Well, what have you done for a ceasefire? To advance the ceasefire, you 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 welcome various opposition groups in London and Paris. Uh, illegal armed groups. You, you, you suddenly were afraid that uh, things seemed to be moving towards peace and a political solution. Basically, you support the interests of armed groups. Many of them have been murdering Christians and other uh, minorities in the Middle East. They have been, uh, they have been committing uh, terrorist acts in uh, uh, churches on Palm, on Palm Sunday. That's who you are, uh, whose interests you are advancing. You, what are you doing? So, basically, it turns out that regime change for you is more important than the positions of the majority of uh, the member states of the United Nations. Mr. Reichardt, you today 
uh, were speaking not on the topic on our agenda today. You, uh, you insulted Syria, Iran, Turkey, other states. Mr. President, I would ask you to to uh, uh, to make sure that the, the, the rules of procedure of this uh, meeting is respected. If if some of the members uh, uh, if some of the members speak insultingly, I cannot accept that you insult Russia. Nevertheless. Mr. Demister, we are very grateful to you for your work and uh, in the run-up to the next round, uh, further work will be required to make sure that the inter-Syrian uh, dialogue is truly representative and broad. All patriotically motivated Syrian uh, uh, parties should have an opportunity to uh, take part in the negotiations on an equal footing in order to engage in discussions of maintaining Syria as a, a unified and secular state where all historical communities would live in peace and take part in rebuilding the country, as has always been the case. From the side of the opposition, there should be a, an inclusive, consolidated delegation, the members of which should have a common position, bearing in mind the views of the key factions in this delegation. There is no room for arrogance. We need to think not about pride and arrogance. We need to think of the future of Syria. That is the substance of your conceptual document, your note. The idea is to, th for, to think of the future of their state, and for that uh, we shouldn't interfere in their affairs. Let them, uh, let them uh, uh, conduct their dialogue calmly, and, and please don't interfere with the work of uh, Mr. de Mistura. Now, in seeking a, a formula for a political solution, and I know that, Mr. de Mistura, this is your position, we cannot uh, allow a, a, a interruption in the work of state institutions. This applies to security uh, uh, institutions that, that bear the main burden in combating the terrorist threat. Look at the other countries of the Middle East and Africa and other regions. We can't even create state institutions on paper, and what you want is to destroy the ones that are still there in Syria, which is the most important country in the region. We insist on discussions being held without any preconditions, and we know that that is your position. Obviously, against the backdrop of political efforts, it is unacceptable that uh, that opponents of the uh, government in Damascus try to uh, make uh, achieve military uh, progress or advances. As we, as we recall. Uh, 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 in, on the eve of the previous negotiations, the opposition tried to uh, make an advance in various parts of the front, including uh, including near the capital. And we hope that uh, uh, that such hotheads will be condemned and their reckless uh, activity will will not be allowed. So that what about you? this is what we're talking about. If you're, you're, you say one thing in the Security Council, but you think something else, whereas in fact what you're doing is is, some, is the third thing. So you think one thing, you say the second thing, and you act third way. So please do your work. I mean, London and Paris, they work with various opposition groups. Call them, uh, talk to them, and say, you need to support the Astana process. You cannot uh, uh, fire on the Russian embassy in Damascus. And then you don't agree even to to uh, publish a, an, an ordinary communique, a press release, condemning the uh, attack on the Russian uh, embassy in Damascus. In a situation where the, uh, where uh, uh, tensions have mounted due to the uh, missile strike of the United States, the importance of the political efforts has become even more important. Obviously. Uh, the uh, pro provocation such as the one that occurred in Sh Sh Han Sheikhoun uh, will only strengthen the positions of uh, those who are in favor of a military solution. We need 
to uh, find out the facts, conduct a, an ex a comprehensive investigation. I was quite surprised to hear that, that uh, French experts uh, have already reached the conclusion that Damascus is, is responsible. I, I'm amazed that this was a conclusion. No one has yet visited the, 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 the site of the crime. How do you know that? The fate of the country should be determined by the Syrians themselves and not by someone else. That is absolutely clear. We, together with other guarantors, together with Turkey, Iran, and I want to also uh, uh, warmly thank uh, the leader, leadership of Kazakhstan. We are ready to continue working at the, on the Astana platform. Russia uh, is, is ready to fulfill its obligations in strengthening the ceasefire. And, but you need to also do your part uh, in working with the various groups. Uh, opposition groups. Astana cannot become a panacea in, in a situation where others are working to undermine it. And a significant progress has been achieved in terms of local truces, which have made it possible to ease the situation and normalize uh, the lives of people from a humanitarian point of view. Many have said today about uh, access to besieged areas. The pro this problem should be resolved with, through access to besieged areas. But let us be fair. Why is and food supplied to areas that are controlled by the government. Are, are they just different kinds of people there? Again? Different kinds of people? Let's be honest. We know the situation. We need support from capitals who, for the time being, are just uh, engaged in, in empty rhetoric and, and, and useless criticism. The Astana process has a unique and, and, and spe special value. It is aimed at, uh, at achieving, in practice, as an end to violence. And what's most important is that it is a direct support to the Geneva process that Mr. de Mistura is uh, leading. We see that Mr. de Mistura and the overwhelming majority of uh, UN member states uh, are greatly value the Astana process. We would like to uh, draw the attention of the international community and the United Nations to significant contamination of the territory of Syria uh, by mines, unexploded ordnance, uh, IEDs. And, you know, we regularly inform you, uh, inform you of the uh, significant activity by Russian experts to deal with this problem. We call on establishing an international coalition uh, on demining Syria. Uh, you know, any kind of blackmail saying that, well, we'll demine once the regime changes, that is unacceptable. It is hypocrisy. It's a, it's, it's a completely hypocritical and unacceptable position. I think the specialized UN service could play an important role in this. Obviously, uh, the humanitarian component here is very important. People need to feel safe and secure when they return to their homes, when they... Uh, return to economic activity, so that children don't explode because of mines, so that civilians don't suffer. We need, we need to clear mines from the uh, site of the World Heritage Site in Palmyra. These are the kinds of issues that we need to work on. When you, when you discuss the issues of solving the problem of migration, that is what we need to discuss. Not, not regime change, but demining, mine clearance, resolving conflicts. People will return uh, to their homes by themselves. They don't need to be forced to do anything. These are the kinds of issues that need to be tackled. We need to work together on, on improving the, 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 the social uh, conditions in which people live.
Instead of that, international and regional forums are convened where uh, billions are pledged, virtual billions of pledged are pledged without even the repre Syrian representatives being present. How is this? How is this related to statements made here in the Security Council that the fate of the Syrian people is in, the ha in their own hands? M many uh, are uh, seriously thinking about the future of the post-conflict future of Syria, the return of IDPs and refugees. That would be the most, Im the most meaningful response to the activity of terrorists, the most important response. But to exclude Damascus, to exclude the representatives of the Syrian Arab Republic from this process is unprofessional, unacceptable, unethical, and arrogant. The political settlement, Mr. Demistura, is the only way of uh, returning Syria to peace and to easing the tensions in the Middle East through Syria and through a political improvement in, uh, in this country. That is the path towards normalizing the situation in many countries of the Middle East. There is an opportunity of making Syria a model of cooperation for a settlement. But the destruct, various destructive geopolitical projects will not contribute to that. At least we will not. We will not give them a free pass in the Security Council. Thank you very much, Madam President. I thank the representative of the Russian Federation, and I now give the floor to the representative of Italy. Thank you, Madam President. At the outset, allow me to thank Special Envoy de Mistura, Grazie Stefan, for his briefing and for especially for his leadership in advancing the political process in very challenging circumstances. Madam President, after six years, violence and destruction continue to plague Syria and cause tremendous suffering to the Syrian people. With time, attacks against civilians have become, if at all possible, even more barbaric and despicable, as the horrific use of chemical weapons in the airstrike in Khan Shakun showed last week. Given the current grave circumstances, a political solution that meets the legitimate aspiration of the Syrian people is needed more than ever. And to relaunch, one that can relaunch the faltering cessation of hostilities and reconsolidate the political process and bring possibly this tragic crisis to the end. We all have a collective responsibility to that. In this regard, let me recall the timely discussions which took place yesterday in the G7 ministerial meeting and then in the G7 enlarged to some key regional stakeholders as Takeda has rightly remembered us. In both occasions, convened by Minister Alfano, all countries conveyed a strong message of support to the political process and notably to the Geneva intra-Syrian negotiations and to the efforts of the Special Envoy, Staffan de Mistura. Madam President, we all need, therefore, to commit to a diplomatic search, not a military search, a diplomatic search to support the Geneva talks and advance the political process by swiftly swiftly implementing all steps agreed by this Council in Resolution 2254. As the negotiation moves to the substance of the issues, no rapid, rapid major breakthroughs can be expected. But we commend the UN Special Envoy for having kept the parties engaged to the process and committed to discussing the way forward in accordance with the defined agenda in line with Security Council Resolution 2254. Efforts should now be redoubled by the parties to address in detail the substantive matters of the agenda. We have consistently encouraged the HNC to adopt a realistic and flexible attitude during the negotiations. Countries with influence on Damascus now, should now press the regime to engage seriously 
in negotiations and avoid dilatory tactics. Madam President, the Astana process gave an important contribution to the relaunch of the cessation of hostilities. However, the situation on the ground has been worsening again, putting a considerable strain on the truth. An effective cessation of hostilities must be pursued as a matter of priority. The Syrian regime has not renounced to achieve military territorial gain and the ceasefire continues to be violated by all parties. Humanitarian access is denied in besieged areas, notably by the regime. All parties must allow rapid, safe, sustained and unhindered humanitarian access to people in need throughout Syria. It is paramount that the co-guarantors of the Astana process and more generally the key international stakeholders exert all their influence in this respect. Progress in Astana on the implementation of the ceasefire, humanitarian access and CBMs feeds, of course, into the Geneva process by creating an environment conducive to the, conducive to the political talks. Finally, Madam President, let me underline that progress on the political track is also key to ensuring better and more effective international cooperation in the fight against terrorism. Any effort to end the violent radicalization, extremism and terrorism needs to include a serious and genuine effort toward a peace peaceful transition and reconciliation process. Only a real political transition, we think, will eradicate terrorism from Syria. I thank you, Madam President. I thank the representative of Italy, and I now give the floor to the representative of Ukraine. Thank you very much, Madam President, and thank you for convening this session in the open chamber. Let me also thank the special representative de Mistura for his dedicated efforts and diligent approach as the deep waters of the complex Syria political situation become ever harder to navigate. Madam President, today we are clearly at the down point with regards to the Syrian political situation. Following the latest two rounds of intra-Syrian talks in Geneva, I believe it is fair to say that unfortunately we have not seen the much desired progress on either of the three plus one baskets. Be it political transition, constitution, elections or counter-terrorism, not much to be optimistic. The only achievement so far is that we have managed to get two delegations to Geneva. Why? The answer is obvious. It is lack of political will, particularly from the Syrian regime, to negotiate in full faith on the core issues. The stalled political process may set in motion a vast number of alternative scenarios that nobody will like. It is only natural that every actor in Syria has a wish list. Yet, Damascus and its allies need to understand that a my way or no way kind of approach, the ultimate victory attitude will lead nowhere, prolong the crisis and feed the extremists. Damascus needs to understand one more thing. The international community has been crystal clear that the political solution is the only way out of the Syrian gogmire and the recipe for this solution has been out there long ago. Any progress on the political track would be unsustainable without a clear adherence to the word and spirit of the 2012 Geneva Communique, 2254 Security Council Resolution, transparent and strictly scheduled political transition and guidance of the UN. Madam President, we believe that Russia has all the means at its disposal to influence Damascus and its allied militias to reconsider their militaristic approach, start supporting political process and national reconciliation, and enter the real negotiations at last. For some reason, this influence has never been employed for good. I remain convinced that unless serious pressure is applied on Damascus and accountability mechanism is established in Syria, we will not see any progress on the political track. And the chemical weapons attack on the 4th of April is a grim reminder of this. We are discouraged by the absence of real results from the Astana process and the ceasefire negotiated within its frameworks. 
One lesson to be learned from this bitter experience is that proliferation of negotiating platforms does not necessarily bear a fruit. It was a good try, but it did not work. Now it is time to concentrate all efforts on the UN-led Geneva process and to make it work. We therefore look forward to the resumption of the intra-Syrian talks in Geneva, hopefully next month. This will be high time for the Damascus and its allies to demonstrate a change, a change in mindset, in intentions, and in attitude. I thank you. I thank the representative of Ukraine, and I now give the floor to the representative of Bolivia. Muchas gracias, señora Presidenta, Madam President, thank you for convening this meeting. Let me begin by saying that given the current scenario, I think that there is full agreement among all members of the Security Council that we must support the efforts being made by Mr. de Mistura and his team in this, in this sensitive issue and also, of course, support the work of the Secretary General. And given this scenario, I was saying a grim scenario, that is, there may be a glimmer of hope at the end of this long, dark tunnel, this tunnel of uh, war ravaging our sister country of Syria. Uh, the Astana process uh, had uh, three meetings and there was unanimous agreement of decisions in this Security Council that have been reflected in the longest lasting ceasefire in this conflict as a result of the efforts of Russia, Turkey, Iran and Kazakhstan. The peace talks sponsored by the UN through its uh, special envoy have already held their fifth round of talks in Geneva on the six baskets mentioned by Mr. De Mistura, governance, the constitutional elections, and the fight against terrorism. Bolivia wishes to express its most fervent support of the work of uh, Ms. Mr. de Mistura and the process in Geneva, the Kazakhstan process, of course, they're both complementary. Another of the areas of convergence, and I hope this is not just talk, is that we have all mentioned the only option to resolve this conflict, which is through a political process. And it's for this reason that we call for the joint work of the involved parties to ensure that the peace process will be taken forward for and by the Syrian people based on a candid, inclusive, and constructive dialogue. We urge parties involved in the crisis to once and for all abandon any provocative action and to ensure that there is no further escalation in tensions in this crisis. We must continue the peace talks and they must seek to strengthen the mandates of this Security Council. This is a clear example that it is possible for us to take coordinated and unanimous action together. As we have said, we believe that any type of unilateral action would only undermine the dialogue process and block the way towards strengthening peace in Syria, and this would be at the expense of millions of lives in Syria. We hope that the Syrian government will continue to fight against terrorism, and we welcome we, we condemn any terrorist acts, regardless of their reason, wherever they take place and by whomever committed. We reiterate the need to ensure that all states will combat terrorism in conformity with the UN Charter and the relevant uh, international law rules. Once again, Bolivia calls on this council to make sure that in accordance with the United Nations Charter, we defend multilateralism. And of course, we must say that the opposite of multilateralism is unilateralism, and this can only undermine the dialogue process that is being taken forward by the Secretary General, Mr. de Mistura. And by the same token, it also prejudges the outcome. We call for an independent, impartial, 
comprehensive and uh, uh, conclusive uh, investigation of the chemical weapon attack. Of course, we do not understand the rationale that there is already condemnation, and it's already said that an attack has taken place. And then following that, there is an investigation. I don't quite see the rationale in that attitude, unless this is the outcome of the intention of bringing some sort of pressure to bear on the Moscow talks taking place now between Russia and the United States. I fail to understand the intentions behind placing on the table a resolution that one already knows will be vetoed. We talked about Resolution 2254 that does uh, council unanimously approved, and we believe that the Security Council, the International Commission now is calling on the 15 members of the Security Council to remain together and jointly work together for peace. Who are the ones benefiting from this war? Who are the ones benefiting from the fact that this Security Council is not working as one? The terrorists, first and foremost. My understanding is that we have a common enemy with a name, Daesh. Al-Nusra, Al-Qaeda, Boko Haram, those are our common enemies. And the international community is demanding that the Security Council act jointly and unison, unison and unanimously to fight the scourge. Who else benefits more from the peace process not being taken further forward and that we do not work unanimously? The military industrial conflicts, those who benefit economically from this war, they are the ones who are receiving the greatest economic gains from this war, from this and other wars. I read an op-ed by Mr. Charles Blau in the New York Times, and he said that the war is also a business, a very lucrative bent business that pays dividends for many people. And I can only hope that the Security Council will shoulder its responsibility under the United Nations Charter, but not just the United Nations Charter, but also its responsibility to humanity to work together that we free humanity from the nightmare of war and that we do not, as a council, to uh, to a cul-de-sac from which we cannot extricate ourselves. Thank you. I will now make my statement. Um, and thank you to the representative of Bolivia. And I will now make my statement as the representative of the United States. Thank you very much, Ms. Mr. DiMastora, for your helpful and informative briefing today. We do appreciate your commitment in this process going forward. Last week, Bashar al-Assad yet again terrorized his own people with one of the world's most horrific weapons. Assad's murderous attack shook every one of us to our core. It once again showed the world that Assad is not a partner for peace. It showed what happens when Assad's allies, Russia, Iran, and Hezbollah, decide to lend their support to a barbaric regime instead of joining the world to stop it. When Assad's planes dropped chemical weapons, his regime violated a resolution from this very council and the Chemical Weapons Convention. Assad mocked every assurance the Russians gave us that there were no chemical weapons in Syria. The United States was compelled to act. We will not allow the use of chemical weapons to go unanswered. We are not going to look the other way. We are watching the regime's actions carefully. To my colleagues from Russia, you are isolating yourselves from the international community every time one of Assad's planes drop another barrel bomb on civilians, and every time Assad tries to starve another community to death. People not just in the West, but across the Middle East and the world are speaking out against Assad's brutality. It is long past time for Russia to stop covering for Assad. It is long past time for Russia to put to push seriously for peace and not continue to be part of the problem. 
The road to peace is long. We won't get a political solution overnight, but we can start by working together to actually de-escalate the conflict. For Russia, getting serious about peace starts by fulfilling its commitment to get chemical weapons out of Syria. We urge Russia to use its influence to make Assad actually live up to his international obligations. That means giving investigators who are already mandated through existing mechanisms full access to the bases where the regime launched its chemical weapons attacks and access to anyone who might have been involved. Russia talks about its commitment to a political solution. They must commit to, to the Geneva talks. Now is the time Russia needs to show the world whether they genuinely want to be a part of the political process. We need to see a real ceasefire on the ground. We need to see a credible political process through which Syrians can chart their future. We need to see Russia choose to side with the civilized world over an Assad government that brutally terrorizes its own people. The United States is ready to do our part. Russia, too, needs to do its part. Getting serious about peace also means we have to be honest about Iran's role in Syria. Iran is Assad's chief accomplice in the regime's horrific acts. Standing next to Assad's generals are Iranian advisors whispering in their ears or giving orders. Standing next to Assad's sol soldiers are Hezbollah militias with weapons courtesy of Iran and the power to overrule the Syrian military. Iran is dumping fuel on the flames of this war in Syria so it can expand its own reach. This council needs to bring attention to Iran's barbaric acts in Syria. We need to collectively demand that Iran stop. We need to make sure Iran cannot use Syria as a base to keep terrorizing the Syrian people and the entire region. This council needs to be serious about peace in Syria, too. Month after month, we all repeat the same points in this chamber. We all say there is no military solution to this conflict. But look at what actually happens on the ground. This council's relevance depends on taking action to condemn those responsible for violence and to hold them accountable for defying this council's demands. This council should not just say it's for a political solution, but also actively pressure the parties to prove it. That means adopting resolutions that say what we mean, resolutions that we are all willing to uphold. So what happens next in Syria depends on what all parties choose to do. For our part, the United States will continue to use influence over any party to push for peace. We will encourage our allies to use their influence on any and all opposition groups, too. We will not support a process that gives cover to Assad while he stalls for time and his forces slaughter the Syrian people. And as we showed last week, we will not stand for continued use of chemical weapons. There are actions by the Assad regime that we simply won't tolerate. The United States firmly believes that a political process can work, despite the odds. We remain committed to the Geneva process. We are ready to throw our weight and resources behind diplomacy. We are ready to help bring this conflict to an end. But our commitment is not enough. The United States is looking for partners who are serious about using their influence over the Assad regime and towards defeating ISIS. Every country needs to do its part. All of us must commit in not just words, but also actions towards the same goal, peace in Syria. Thank you. I will now resume my function as President of the Council. And I now give the floor to the representative of the Syrian Arab Republic. And we ask, Mr. Representative, that you be conscious of time. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. I hope uh, you will be patient enough to listen to us in your capacity as President of the Council for this month. I listened carefully to every colleague, and I have the right and the duty as a founding member of this international organization to inform our colleagues of the point of view of my government. Fourteen years ago, 
to the date. On the 9th of uh, April 2003, the day of the invasion of Iraq, a couple of days before, I was sitting in the place of the Italian ambassador, along with uh, the ambassador of my country at the time. I attended the meeting where Colin Powell, your foreign minister, spoke. He talked about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. I was there in that session. Everyone remembers what the heads of uh, investigative delegation said about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. But of Echeos was one of them. Butler, Scott, Hans Blex, and others. They said that there were no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, and that these accusations were a pretext to invade and occupy Iraq. And all of you remember, maybe some of you remember, that this council decided at the end of 2008, after investigation into so-called Iraq uh, WMDs was closed, decided to bury the UNSCOM and UNVMIC reports. To overlook these reports, and bury them in the ground so that no one can reach except for the uh, Secretary General. They buried them in vaults and they said that these vaults would only be opened after 60 years. Can you imagine the secrets in these vaults? Britain's Brexit from the European Union might have encouraged it to look for a new role for it in the world by using an irrational and extreme statements and positions in this council. This reminds us of the criminal role of Tony Blair, his role in the invasion of Iraq 14 years ago, after fabricating the lie of Iraqi WMDs. And after pushing the American elephant to destroy the Iraqi China, China ware, with the brutality that the Iraqi people continues to pay the price for to this day. Madam President, I deliver my statement today after I've been absent for more than three months. As I was leading the delegation of the Syrian Arab Republic to multiple rounds of intra-Syrian talks in Asatana and Geneva to launch a serious dialogue that would lead to a political solution led, led by Syrians themselves without any external interference and that would unify counter-terrorism efforts. One week ago, we thought that we would be coming to this meeting to inform you of the progress achieved recently in Asatana and Geneva and to give the necessary momentum and support to His Excellency the Special Envoy, Demistura, and to all parties who work seriously to reach a political settlement to the crisis in my country, Syria, and to coordinate our counter-terrorism efforts. Despite this optimism, the U.S. administration decided to repeat the same bloody theatrical play that it had staged 14 years ago in this council against Iraq, a play entitled The Lie of the Iraqi WMDs. Once again, the U.S. administration is taking the terrorist war against my country, Syria, to unprecedented and dangerous levels by switching from a proxy aggression through armed terrorist groups under their control for years to a new and direct aggression through a direct military action against my country, Syria.
The United States has been leading terrorism in Syria along with its allies and agents in the region. It has provided all forms of support to terrorist groups to commit the most heinous crimes against civilians and against Syrian infrastructure. These include the practices of the so-called international coalition. Recent incidents have proven that this coalition has only destroyed infrastructure, bombarded civilians and provided air cover to al-Nusra Front, ISIL and other affiliated terrorist groups, as was the case when the coalition bombarded the Syrian army position in Al-Tharda Mountain, Deir Zor, on the 17th of September 2016. The direct military support and the air cover to armed terrorist groups was not only provided by the so-called international coalition. Israel was first to win the honor, the honor of supporting terrorism. Since terrorist groups, including Al-Nusra Front started their operations in the area of, of uh, separation, Israel has provided all forms of support to these groups, including medical relief and care to injured terrorists at the expense of the Qatari regime, as you all know. Israel has provided an air cover by launching airstrikes against Syrian army positions every time the Syrian army was able to gain ground against these terrorist groups. Even worse, Israel has provided support to the terrorist group, ISIL, directly through airstrikes launched on the 17th of March 2017 against Syrian army positions in Palmyra to support the operations of ISIL in that city. The same theatricals took place on the morning of Friday, the 7th of April 2017. At the time, the U.S. administration and its allies felt that the terrorist groups who have been armed, trained and financed by these countries have began to, began to lose ground because of the heavy blows dealt to them by the Syrian army. They have launched their premeditated and uh, flagrant attack against al Shuairat air base on the pretext of the use of chemical weapons in Khan Sheikhoun a village that is under the control of al-Nusra Front. It did not stop there. This attack was preceded by political expediency when the U.S. decided to exploit the international mechanisms of the Security Council to table provocative draft resolutions that would put the blame on the Syrian government for the abhorrent use of the chemical weapons and to distance any suspicions from the real enemy, terrorists and their supporters. This dangerous attack had been thought through for many months in the back rooms of intelligence agencies in Tel Aviv, Riyadh, Doha, Ankara, Amman, Washington, London and Paris. These same capitals have sought over the past years to provide their terrorist elements in Syria, notably Al Nusra Front, with toxic chemicals for them to use and then to put the blame on the Syrian government. That was the case in Khan al Asal on the 19th of March 2013, in Eastern Ghouta on the 21st of August 2013, and in Talminis on the 21st of April 2014, in Sarmin on the 16th of March 2015, in Komainis on the 16th of March 2016. I will not go into the detail of more than 90 letters addressed to this council since the beginning of the crisis. These letters detail the possession by armed groups, by armed terrorist groups, of chemical elements to be used against civilians and to put the blame on the Syrian government to demonize this government in the eyes of the council members and in the eyes of the public opinion, and then to justify any internal interference in the internal affairs of Syria. Some of these letters even detailed the smuggling of sarin from Libya through Turkey on a civilian airplane by using a Syrian citizen 
Two liters of sarin were transported from Libya through Turkey to terrorist groups in Syria. We have given you the names, the dates, the incidents, the events, and even the itinerary of this plane from Libya through Turkey to Syria. I would like to refer you to a statement made by the former French foreign uh, minister, Roland Dumas, in June 2013. In that statement, he said that during a visit to London, he was made privy to a conspiracy against Syria to destroy Syria and to isolate its government given its anti-Israeli position. That was two years before the start of the crisis in Syria. Roland Dumas was made privy to a plot to destroy Syria two years before the crisis even started. I would also refer you to a report in the British Daily Mail in January 2013, a report which was withdrawn and deleted from its website shortly after. The report details emails between high officials in British corporation called Britam Defence. The emails talk of a plot agreed on by Washington, which says that Qatar, in cooperation with Turkey, would finance insurgents in Syria to use chemical weapons. At the time, the former U.S. president had only to create what he called a red line, saying that any use of chemical weapons in Syria would, be, would not be tolerated. That red line was used to justify a military aggression against Syria. However, fortunately, he backtracked at the last minute when his European allies decided to jump ship, given pressure from the international public opinion and the rejection of any interference in my country, Syria. Madam President, documents leaked by WikiLeaks prove that the White House had given a green light to a chemical attack in eastern Ghouta, in the suburbs of Damascus, to put the blame on the Syrian government and to use that attack as incentive for an international military aggression against my country, Syria. Today, Madam President, the new U.S. administration, and we had hopes when that new administration started its work in Washington, this same administration who claims that counterterrorism is one of its priorities could not but go back to the same pretext, the red line pretext, and to fabricate the incident of the chemical weapons in Khan Sheikhoun to launch an attack against Syria and to sabotage the Asatana and Geneva talks and to save the armed terrorist groups from their predicament and to help other opposition groups to shirk their obligations related to the political settlement and to counter-terrorism. Why was that? Because we were able to add another basket to the talks in Geneva, the basket of counter-terrorism, something that the enemies of the political process did not like. Otherwise, how can a sane and reasonable person accept the lies and the accusations against my country, Syria, accusations of the use of a chemical weapon that we do not even possess? We do not have this weapon, and this has been confirmed in the statement of the gym in June 2014 before this exact council, Sigrid Kag, said in June 2014 that Syria no longer had any chemical weapons. Even worse, those who destroyed the chemical weapons at the time were the U.S. ships in the Mediterranean. What a paradox. This comes at a time when the Syrian army and its allies are making great strides against terrorism, at a time when national and local reconciliation agreements are being concluded across Syria, at a time when Astana talks have been able to make progress, stressing, as Mr. Demistura said, stressing the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Syria, which means border control on the borders with Turkey and Jordan, to stop the flow of terrorists, to end hostilities and to separate uh, armed groups from al-Nusra and ISIL and to unify counter-terrorism efforts. These are the results of Astana. These results, if implemented, would 
lead to an end to the Syrian crisis within 24 hours. The attack comes at a time when Geneva talks were able to shape a new vision for a roadmap in Syria, at a time when my country is witnessing a diplomatic detente and visits from different parliament parliamentary missions, including Western parliaments, to inform the public opinion of the real events in Syria and to call for their government's support to Syria in its war against terrorism. I put this question to every person who still resorts to logic and reason and law when trying to understand this blind madness and this brutal appetite to burn my country Syria and the region to the ground and to move with international relations to a new phase of wars and conflicts. And let me remind you that only terrorism, extremism, hatred, the, the military might and the law of the jungle will be the only victors of this war. My country has sent to you and to other members of the Council a letter inviting you and inviting the Director General of the OPCW, inviting him to send a technical mission to Khan Sheikhoun and to Shuairat Air Base to uncover the truth. Which means that the Syrian government wants to know who used the chemical agent in my country, Syria. We should all raise our voices in unison and say no, no, no to war, no to the war that is being promoted by warmongers and the enemies of law. They say that this is business as usual. They say that while they sit comfortably in their homes enjoying their privileges, their revenues and their arrogance. Madam President, during the last round of talks in Geneva, my country has given a number of papers to the Special Envoy, starting with a paper on general principles on, uh, related to a political solution in Syria to find a common ground to discuss all issues in Syria, which was part of the four baskets. We have also issued other papers, including one on counter-terrorism. Over the nine days of negotiations, we have discussed all these items on the agreed agenda. However, unfortunately, we did not find across the negotiating table a serious partner, a serious partner committed to counterterrorism and to a political solution. And there is also the problem of the multitude of oppositions, no one unified opposition. My country rejects all attempts by the United States, uh, the UK and France to sabotage the efforts of the Special Envoy and to block the Geneva and Asetana talks. We have engaged seriously, patiently and responsibly in these talks because our people hold us historically responsible for ending, for defending our country and stemming the bloodshed. The American attack will not prevent the Syrian government and its allies from continuing its war against terrorism and from engaging seriously in the next rounds of negotiations to discuss the agreed agenda and to engage seriously on all issues related to governance, constitution, elections and counter-terrorism in a parallel tracks. We will spare no effort to support any genuine endeavor that seeks to reach a political solution that would allow Syrians themselves and on their own decide their own future in a manner that would preserve the sovereignty, independence, unity and territorial integrity of Syria. In closing, Madam President, I find the statement of my colleague from France a bit strange, that he and uh, the other P2s, or what they call the P3, were unable to table a vote resolution and to uh, a, a draft resolution and to put it to a vote. This is a shameful diplomatic act. It is a provocative act that did not wait for an, in, an honest and independent investigation by the gym. This 
draft resolution is a misuse of the instruments of the Security Council, which reminds us of the same act committed by the UK and US against Iraq 14 years ago to the day, April 9th, 2003. Thank you, Madam President. I acknowledge the statement of the representative of the Syrian Arab Republic. There are no more speakers on the list. We will reconvene at 3 o'clock. This meeting is adjourned.